Hello, we're here with Daniel Povey, and today I'm asking him, what exactly do you do as a computer science researcher? Okay, so let, let, let me start a long time ago because uh, I think what you do at different stages of your, your career is a little bit different. So after I, so during my PhD work, I was working on like computer speech recognition used different things back then. It was all about Gaussian mixture models. And I had some idea about a better way to train the models and it was pretty successful. And so it was a lot of coding, mostly coding and like running experiments, which means you, an experiment just means in this context that you see how well your model works and like how accurate it is at predicting what people said. Uh, and then after my PhD, I, I went to IBM and I was doing the same kind of thing, coding, running experiments, and uh, sometimes writing papers. Uh, now, I guess for most of my career, I've, I've done similar things, but the emphasis switched a bit later on to uh, writing uh, big software code bases like the Caldi speech recognition code base. There was still a lot of, uh, you know, kind of coming up with new ideas and stuff, but the emphasis was a little bit more on coding for a while. And then when I went into uh, academia at Johns Hopkins, there was also a bunch of like supervising students and coming up with ideas for them to to do it, to, you know, to, to explore and helping them review papers and, uh, Things like that. I I didn't uh, didn't go for a tenure track position, so I didn't have a te any teaching responsibilities, which it would have been too much for me. I think just because it requires too much energy, that kind of job. You have to do like three different jobs. So right now, I'm I'm back in uh, industry. I'm working in Xiaomi in, in Beijing, and uh, I have I have a team of uh, like five or six guys. And some of them are quite experienced. So I actually spend a lot less time writing code than I used to. Firstly, as you get older, you just don't have as much energy to write tons of code, at least I don't. So it's good that I have some really experienced people who can do a good job. And so I don't have to be the one where someone asks a question about something and I, but I'm no longer the main one who answers it. There's now other people who can do that. But I, I've gone a little bit back towards my uh, what I think of as my core competency, which is like uh, ba basically optimizing our uh, up to optimizing the models we use for uh, speech recognition, like kind of deep neural nets, that kind of thing, coming up with different uh, topologies and different ways of training them. Uh, so I, I do actually a lot a lot of uh, I do a certain amount of coding, but usually it's small changes where I have some idea and I uh, and I code that up. So I'm not really writing big pieces of software anymore. Most mostly the guys are doing that, and and I'm mostly focusing on the actual modeling part. Hmm. Okay. Uh, How did you like know that you wanted to do speak speech recognition out of like all of the other fields how did you like find that niche topic well i i, I don't i wouldn't say that it's some dream i had since childhood you know like i think people are always encouraged to say on job applications that whatever they're doing is something that they have this inborn passion for but for me it was pretty random that uh I finished my first my bachelor's degree in Cambridge, uh, and the last year of my degree was computer science. And one of the lecturers there suggested that I look into this master's course that they had about speech and language processing. Uh, and I basically, so yeah, I applied to that course and I got in and the main part of that was speech recognition, at least for me, the main part of it was. And I uh, did a project in speech recognition with Phil Woodland, who was one of the lecturers and researchers there. And then I ended up doing my PhD with him. 
So I pretty much fell into it by default. I, I wouldn't say that I have any special or unusual affinity for it. Yeah. Okay. And when, like, what exactly is happening when you're researching? Uh, I mean, a lot of the time it's just trying to solve a particular problem. Like, oh, we ran this model. It doesn't work on this data. Let's try to look into what went wrong with the model, you know, look into the statistics of the parameters and we find something, let's suppose we find something that doesn't look right. Some particular part of the model has really small activations or whatever it is, then trying to find why that happened and how we can prevent it happening. And, you know, we make some change to how the model is trained or how it's initialized or something like that. Hmm. Okay. So yeah. what is what you're doing now different from what you were doing like 30 years hmm. ago or whatever? I would say kind of in spirit, it's it's mostly the same. The, the tools have changed a little bit, like I'm using more Python and less C++. And the uh, methods have changed that we're no longer using mixtures of Gaussians, we're using these deep neural nets. But I think the, the general process of like writing code and then running some job and getting some result and trying to optimize something, that's pretty similar. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, wait, let me think of another question. Mm -hmm. What What is another question? What is another question? <laughs> That's not really my job as the interviewee to decide. Uh, let, let me think. Is researching more interesting for you than what the mm -hmm. average person in computer science is doing right now? Uh, well, I think... The, the good thing about research is that if you're doing the right thing, you can feel like you're making a difference. Like you can feel like, oh, if this is successful, everyone's going to be using it. It's going to affect a lot of people's lives. Of course, whether it's for the better or for the worse is sometimes hard to tell. Uh, whereas let, let's suppose you're, you know, you're working on the power grid and you maintain some substation or something like you probably feel your life is pretty routine and that as long as you do your job competently, like you're just picking up a salary. So I think may maybe, maybe it's for people who have a narcissistic personality or have delusions of grandeur or something that they want to feel like they're making a difference. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I'm, I, I'm still not convinced. Like, are you actually having fun? I'm actually having fun. Well, is anyone having fun? Like, I don't think many of us, I think if we were having fun all the time, it would be a sign of mental illness. I don't think, I don't think a human in their normal state is having fun 24 seven, but sometimes it's fun. Okay. Do you think research is like a creative profession? Like you have to be creative to be a researcher? Well, I think it probably helps, but, you know, there's always a balance between being creative and actually executing your ideas. I, I think one of my faults is that I tend to have a lot of ideas, but I actually generate, sometimes I generate them too fast to really get results from any of them. Like, there's definitely a balance that, that you, uh, maybe you don't want to be too creative. So you literally... Mm -hmm. I'm not even convinced why people are thinking that computer science is even fun. Well, listen, just because it's fun for one person doesn't mean it's fun for another. Like, there's people who really enjoy being fashion designers, for instance. And yeah, I don't really... The money, that's the issue. No, I don't think they just do it for the money because most fashion designers don't make anything. I think they do it because they're passionate about women's clothes or whatever it is. I, my point is that different people have enjoy different things. Like probably some people really enjoy like being in the forest and like cutting down trees or whatever. And for them, that's amazing. But for other people, it would be super boring. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. that would be it. 
Bye-bye. That was Daniel. Bye. Bye.